Okay, welcome back, everybody, to the session number three. The title is Labor Market Shocks and Policies. And so the first paper is about fiscal management of aggregate demand, and it's going to be presented by Axel Ferrier from the Paris School of Economics. All right, so uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us in the program. I'm very happy to be here. So this is joint work with Gaston Navarro, who is an economist at the Fed. So the usual disclaimers apply. So in this paper, we are interested in the design of countercyclical policies. So of course, as you all know, there's large literature um, trying to analyze the stabilis stabilization properties of monetary policy, with the main instrument being the nominal rate, as well as of fiscal policy, with fiscal instruments such as government expenditures, unemployment benefits, or lump sum checks. Less attention, though, has been devoted to, in the literature, to the, to the, to the analyze, to analyzing the stabilization properties of labor taxes. So arguably, labor taxes are not commonly used in practice to stabilize the economy. But uh, empirically, the, we have evidence, though, that uh, tax cuts seem to have large aggregate effects. So in this paper, we are going to adopt a very uh, policy-driven approach. I'm going to build a Hank model, which I'll use to quantify the effectiveness of various fiscal stabilization packages, including one using labor taxes, to, to stabilize the economy after a negative demand shock. So practically, we are going to build a Hank model and we'll ha we'll ha with three additional features, which we think are particularly relevant to quantify the different packages. So first of all, we'll have heterogeneous stochastic discount factors, which will generate a distribution of marginal propensity to consume and therefore heterogeneous consumption responses. Second, we'll have endogenous labor supply at the extensive margin, which will generate a distribution of labor elasticities and therefore heterogeneous labor responses. And third, we'll also account for unemployment risk, which will be of heterogeneous incidence in the distribution of households and varying with the cycle. In that setup, we are going to uh, sort of engineer a demand-driven recession by a negative shock to marginal utility. And then we'll explore the stabilization properties of three main fiscal packages. So the first package will be a targeted transfer package, what we call a TT package, which will be a transfer targeting low-income low households regarding of their employment status. The second package is also a very standard package, is the unemployment insurance UI package, which will be a transfer targeting the unemployed. And the third package, which is kind of the new thing we want to really look at, is what we call the tax credit package, TC package, will be a transfer targeted to the low-income working households. And because working households pay labor taxes, this tax credit package will be akin to a labor tax cut to the working poor. So what do we find? we find that this TC package is actually the most effective to stabilize the economy. And this happens despite the fact that we account for larger unemployment risk uh, in recessions. So to give you a sense of numbers, we find that the one-year output multiplier will be equal to 0.9 for the TC package as compared to 0.6 for the UI package and only 0.4 for the TT package. And this is going to happen because this TC package will stimulate not only consumption, of course, to give transfers to the poor, but also it will stimulate labor supply thanks to the labor tax cut. So I'll discuss my calibration in some details, try to convince you that the quantification of the labor response is uh, relevant. If time allows, I'll discuss a bit of robustness and I'll have a few words about implementability of such policies. I'll skip the literature for the interest of time. Okay, so the model is going to be a hank relatively standard, so it's going to be, we'll have a continuum of households who will uh, save using a risk -free, uh, in a risk-free bond up to a borrowing constraint. Households will, they will face idiosyncratic labor productivity shocks as well as unemployment shocks. And in the model, unemployment is going to be fully exogenous. On top of that, we'll have stochastic discount factors and an individual labor decision. On top of the household blocks, we'll have firms, very standard, facing uh, with sticky prices. We'll assume a linear technology in labor, there's no capital in the model. And we'll have a government which will also be very standard with the fiscal authority which will finance spending, transfers, unemployment benefits, and the debt service with labor and capital taxes. And we'll have a monetary authority which will implement a standard Taylor rule. 
So let me give you more details about the households and their, their value function. So households are going to be fully characterized by four individual state variables, their level of asset A, their discount factor beta, their productivity X, and their employment status eta. So unemployment, again, is fully exogenous. So I want you to think of households moving between two islands, one being the islands of unemployment, where households cannot work and they receive unemployment benefits, and one in which they can work uh, and they will navigate between these two islands in a fully exogenous process. Let me show you the value function first of a household who can work. So if the household can work, the first thing he has to do is to choose this works, yes, to choose uh, whether he wants to work or not. So here is the individual labor decision. If he works, he has positive labor income, which depends on its productivity x. And then he also choose consumption and savings to maximize the value function, given a standard budget constraint, which will be consumption plus new savings equal to past savings plus labor income, capital income minus capital and labor income taxes, plus, plus transfers, plus dividends, and the households face a borrowing constraint. So to that very standard value function problem, we actually add a preference shock on the discrete labor choice, which we assume will be distributed gamble with the variance rho h. So why do we do that? We do that because this variance rho h will give me a chance to sort of discipline the sensibility or the, the response of labor supplies in my model. Why? Because if I have very large rho h, then like labor decisions will be sort of fully determined by your preference shock, and therefore will be independent of your economic conditions, and labor elasticities will be going to zero. Well, instead, my, if, when my rho h goes to zero, then my labor supply decisions are fully determined by my wage, my tax rates, and I'll have very large labor elasticities. So that gives me a chance to better discipline the response of labor supply. On top of that, I'll have standard AI1 process for the discount factor, for productivity and for employment status, which again is, is assumed to be exogenous. In terms of taxes, we'll have the standard flat capital tax together with a progressive log linear labor tax, where lambda t captures the level of the tax function and tau captures its progressivity. So now let me show you the value function of an unemployed household. So it's going to be very similar to the one of the employed worker, except that there's no uh, hours decision. So the an employed household that has no labor income, but it will actually receive benefits BT. So we model this unemployment benefits following Kekre with two parts. So the first part, which is here, captures sort of the statutory part of unemployment benefits with zeta to match the fraction of recipients. And then conditional on receiving, the, uh, the, the level of benefits is determined by the replacement rate R up to a cap UI. But on top of this statutory uh, benefit, we also assume an additional transfer, small transfer, which is, mean, which is meant to capture things like uh, additional uh, income from maybe a secondary earner in the household, which will be used to calibrate, to, to match actually the consumption of the unemployed to the unemployed in the model as compared to the data. So that's we are going to capture sort of how poor are the unemployed in the model. Okay, apart from that, everything else is also standard, and we have the same sort of AI1 process for the discount factor, productivity, and employment. Okay, so then the firm, very standard, is, will have the two layer structure with the final good producer and intermediate good producers. We have sticky prices at la Rotenberg, and we obtain the standard Phillips curve that we have seen earlier today. We'll have a monetary authority with the parameter phi pi, will tell me the sensitivity of inflation. And for the fiscal authority, we'll have a standard borrowing constraint. The one thing I need to tell you is that, so when we are going to implement fiscal stabilization packages, we, saw, we need to take a stand on um, the financing of these packages. And this is going to be captured by a fiscal rule with a parameter phi d, which will tell me uh, the level of public debt adjustment in my economy. So when phi d is equal to zero, I finance all stabilization packages with larger labor taxes. While phi d goes to one, I'll, I'll finance all stabilization packages with public debt. Okay, so let me tell you a few words about the calibration. If, let me just check the time. About the calibration. So we'll have a quarterly model that we're going to calibrate to the liquid wealth, so kind of standard, where the process for stochastic beta will, be, will help to match wealth inequality. We'll have labor supply decisions where B, the labor disutility, will match an employment rate of 78%, and the variance of the Gumbel shock rho H will match an average annual labor elasticity of 0.3, a number that we see as standard literature. 
Then we'll have a standard process for productivity. And then I'm going to uh, discipline the flows between my two employment islands by uh, the empirical estimates, the distribution of estimates provided in Muller. So in Muller 2017, provides estimates of job finding rates, which are which he shows are constants in the early wage distribution. So the job finding rate is homogeneous in the distribution of households, while of course the separation rates are falling in early wages, such that, so when we do that, we get an unemployment that is equal to 4.3% in average in city state, but of unequal distribution. So practically here, I'm plotting, and I'm missing the axis, sorry about that, I'm plotting for each level of productivity X in log, I'm plotting the level of employment, unemployment in steady state, sorry. So what you can see is that for the median worker average, the unemployment in steady state is about 4.3%, which is the number we just saw. But for low income households or low hourly wage, unemployment is going to be much larger. Uh, but of course, the density here of households is also very small. Okay, so now firm. Uh, so the firm is, uh, again, we use standard parameters to calibrate the firm and we'll have a slope of the Phillips curve of 0.03. And we'll assume a coefficient phi pi of 1.5 for the response of inflation. So that I would say are standard numbers. And then we calibrate the fiscal policy sort of very carefully because it's kind of what we like to do, but it's all numbers are very standard. What I just want to tell you is that we have a debt adjustment parameter of 0.75, which means that a large part of the fiscal stabilization package is is financed with a larger level of debt. Okay, so the last thing I need to tell you is how unemployment varies with a cycle. And for that, we assume an Okun's low type of relationship between output and unemployment, which means that we are going to assume that when output falls by 1%, uh, unemployment increases by 50 basis points. So why 0.5? So first of all, it's a parameter that is typically used uh, at the Fed, but it's also, of course, supported by empirical evidence. If at all, I'll say this number is a little bit large, and it could be a bit smaller, which is sort of good for our calibration because we want to be conservative. So how do we generate that in the model? We are going to generate that by assuming responses of the distribution of job finding rates and job separation rates to the cycle. So in short, the job finding rates will fall in recession, while the job separation rates will increase in recession. And the distribution of these rates, uh, again, is going to be disciplined by the elasticity numbers provided in Muller. So what does it give us technically? It gives us that, so su suppose that the economy falls in recession and output falls by 1%. So what you can see is that the average unemployment rate of the, I mean, the unemployment rate of the average worker goes up by about 50 basis points. Here I'm plotting the difference in unemployment between the recession and the steady state. But unemployment increases much more for the poor than for the rich households. Okay, so, once I have calibrated my economy like that, I'm going to spend two more slides to try to, um, to investigate the calibration. And in particular, I want to try to convince you that the, the response of uh, labor in the model is, um, is well calibrated. So for that, first of all, I'm going to compute labor elasticities. So I'm going to follow a paper by Eroza et al and compute labor, elastic in the, labor elasticities in the model by assuming a 1% temporary change in after tax rates and I'm going to compute annual labor response after this shock. When we do that, what we get is an average annual elasticity of 0.3. But importantly, there's an empirical uh, literature which has shown that labor elasticities tend to decline with income, and labor elasticities, el elasticities are particularly small for high-income, high-educated workers, and they're actually larger for low-income, low-educated workers with elasticities uh, which are found to be even above one for some subgroups. So when we do this exercise by income quartile in our model, we find labor elasticities, which are also declining with income, but with a level of heterogeneity overall that is kind of moderate, which is about 0.2 for the top quartile and about 0.44 for the bottom quartile. We also check marginal propensity to consume, MPC in the model. And so we get an average quarterly MPC of 0.13, which is maybe a little bit low as compared to the, the evidence. Which of course, leads to a, I mean, leads a larger annual MPC. Importantly, it's falling with wealth. I didn't put the numbers here. It has a standard shape. And it is larger for the unemployed at about 0.32. And we also simulate the model and find that consumption drops by about 10% when households fall into unemployment, which is, uh, again, in line with uh, the empirical evidence. 
The last thing I want to check is how the model uh, responds in terms of aggregates to tax cuts. So for that, we have the evidence of Mertens and Raven, who look at exogenous uh, uh, cuts in personal income taxes and consume multipliers out of that. And they find that uh, so when the government lose two dollars, uh, sorry, one dollar of uh, fiscal revenues, output actually increases by more than two dollars. It means that the multiplier is above two, which is really very large. So in the model, we replicate this exercise, and depending on how we do it, we get something between 0.6 or 0.7, which is smaller than in the data. So in that sense, we see that our, we see our calibration as conservative in the sense that we get smaller aggregate responses to tax cuts that in the data. We get moderate heterogeneity in labor elasticities. We actually get a rather large response of unemployment. And still, we are going to find that this tax credit package is really the most effective to stabilize the economy. Let me show you uh, the experiment now. So we model a recession in a very standard way by a negative demand shock, omega t, which will go back to steady state at a persistence of 0.75 quarterly. And this shock will be unexpected, transitory, and with perfect foresight, so it's a standard MIT shock. This shock will generate a recession that is also very standard, so we have like output falling, consumption falling as well, unemployment going up, and then wages go down, and inflation as well go down. Okay, so then on that no stabilization benchmark recession, we are going to uh, compare the effect of three fiscal stabilization packages. So I'm going to calibrate my three packages so that they all cost the same, and they will cost the equivalent of a one-type check of $200 to each household. So the first package is going to be this targeted transfer package, which I will design to mimic uh, the, the design, actually, of checks which were sent in the US in 2008, for instance, meaning those checks were targeting the low-income households, and they were based on last year income, the income of 2007. But because I want to give it some sort of automatic stabilizer flavor, I will also assume that this package uh, has a persistence rho omega, so the same as the, the persistence of the recession. So how do we model that technically? So I'm going to uh, use previous work we have done on transfers and use a logistic function so that the transfer will be maximum for the lowest level of income of households and will phase out uh, as when income increase in the distribution. Okay, but because I want to keep this uh, flavor of like, you know, based on last year income, or I, I don't want my transfer to have a direct distortionary effect on the decision of the households, we are going to assume that the transfer phase out with the no recession income, so sort of your steady state income. The transfer will be uh, initially, the highest level of transfer will be $900, and it will phase out quickly such that only 20% of the households receive uh, more than $50 in the first quarter. So that's for my first package. My second package will be the unemployment insurance package, which will be a transfer sent to all unemployed households, again with the same persistence rho omega, which will be initially equal to a little bit above $1,000 for the first quarter. And the last package will be this tax credit package, which will be a transfer to the working low-income households. So we are going to model that with the same sort of logistic function, but households will be eligible only if they are in the work island and they choose to work. And this check will be, the maximum amount of the check in the first quarters will be again uh, something close to, will be about $800 and will phase out over income and then again will be given with the persistence of omega. So now let me show you the input response function for each of these packages. So starting from the benchmark without stabilization, the first package, the targeted transfer package, uh, does reduce the initial contraction in output by about 20%. So consumption also decreased by less, unemployment increased by less. But wages are higher than in the no stabilization benchmark, which actually leads to higher inflation, to positive inflation. The second package, the UI package, sort of works better at uh, compressing the initial drop in, in, in output, and thus it mitigates the contraction in output by about 30%. Consumption also goes down by less, unemployment rate goes up by less, uh, and it has less of an inflationary effect. Um, but the third package, the tax credit package, is really the one that is the most effective in reducing the, the drop in output by about 50%. Consumption, again, decreased by much less, employment rates increased by less, and actually, it also has much, much, I mean, wages increase by much less, and therefore inflation also increased by much less. 
So I can translate these numbers into multipliers by comparing, uh, comparing the output gain due to the stabilization package to the output in the no stabilization benchmark. And that gives us, on the left, multipliers for output, which are about so 0.9 after four quarters for the TEC package, as compared to only 0.6 for the UI and 0.4 for the targeted transfer package. And of course, consumption multipliers are going to be very similar because uh, we have a model without capital. OK, so why is the tax credit package so efficient? So it is so efficient so to better understand the forces behind the model. I'm going to do a simple decomposition to uh, separate consumption channel versus labor channel, or consumption or demand effects versus uh, supply side effects. So to do that, I'm going to use the equilibrium prices and taxes and unemployment path of the no stabilization benchmark model. I'm going to keep that fixed a bit like in a partial equilibrium uh, exercise. And then I'm going to implement each fiscal stabilization package. I will, comply, I will compute labor and consumption policy of the households for each package. And I will, with that, I will compute what I will call a supply output, which will use household labor supply policies, and the demand output, which will use household consumption policies for each package. So first of all, if I look at the TT package, so again, the, bl the black line is the benchmark, which for, for which, of course, uh, output in supply is equal to output in demand, because I, that's uh, my equilibrium sequences. But then, like, if I implement the targeted transfer package, I can see that it has a negative effect on labor supply incentives. That's kind of normal. You give more transfers to households, they work less, uh, which is why, actually, wages have to increase in equilibrium, and therefore, it's inflationary. Instead, in terms of demand, uh, you give transfer to the households, they consume out of that, and so it has a positive effect on the demand output. The UI package now has less of a uh, has, I mean, it has less of a negative effect on labor supply incentives because it's specifically given to the unemployed. And it has more of an uh, expansionary effect on demand because uh, unemployed households have higher MPC, so they will consume more out of their check. The tax credit package now actually has a positive effect on, uh, on labor supply because of the labor tax cut, workers want to work more. And it also has a larger effect than the, even the UI package in terms of demand. Why? Because so you give transfers to low-income uh, workers, but you also induce some workers to work more, and they will consume this extra income, which is why uh, the, the, the effect on demand is actually the, the, the highest. OK, so if I take a step back, it looks like temporary labor tax cuts may be quite effective to stabilize the economy after a recession. Of course, there are some limits, for instance, on how we quantify the UI package. So in particular, we abstract from endogenous job search. So we may be overstating the stabilization properties of the UI package. We also abstract from heterogeneity between recipients and non-recipients of benefits. So in that respect, we may also be understating the effect of the UI package. But I wanted to say a few words about implementabil implementability of this TC package. So practically, what I'm trying to say is that labor taxes, uh, I mean, changes in labor taxes at the PNS cycle frequency may be good to stabilize the economy, but of course, I'm not trying to suggest that you know, we should adjust the entire schedule of personal income taxes at the business cycle frequency, which would seem to be probably unfeasible. Yet, we do have uh, in the real world examples of labor taxes, which are uh, collected uh, by the firm every month, uh, which are, for instance, for the US payroll taxes. So one could imagine an additional tax that would fluctuate with the cycle, maybe like the way the UI benefits can fluctuate with the cycle in the US in some states which would have the advantage of being collected by the firm and having a direct effect on the budget constraint of the household. Okay, I'll skip this point, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, so I'm gonna use my last, uh, I mean, the minutes I still have to discuss three last points, which I think are quite important relative to this question. So first of all, the importance of public debt, and I have a few words about distributional concerns, and I'll finish with something about public spending. So first, on the role of public debt, so I told you that in the current set, I mean, the, in what we have seen so far, when we implement a fiscal package, we finance a large part of it with public debt. I want to understand how important is that for our results. So I'm going to, con to compute again uh, all the paths, assuming that there's no debt response. And I'm going to compute again multipliers for both the UI and the TC package with and without debt. So the solid line are the multipliers you have seen before. The dashed line are the new multipliers when assuming that there are no debt response. So of course, what you can see is that using public debt, 
is going to help to stabilize the economy. In a sense here, really there's uh, nothing new here. But what I think is particularly important, interesting, is this dash yellow line, the TC package no debt. When you think about it, what is this TC package no debt? It is just a labor tax cut to the poor, which is financed by an increase in labor taxes to all households simultaneously. So it is just a labor tax cut to the poor financed by higher taxes than the rich. So it's nothing else but a positive temporary shock in labor income tax progressivity. That we see has an expansionary effect in the economy, which I think is a fine that's lovely or interesting. Second thing I wanted to discuss was about the distributional effects of the tax credit package. So for that, I'm going to show you measures of consumption by income group, and I'm going to compare this level of consumption with and without stabilization. So first, for the TT package, so here I have five income groups, which are the four quartiles and the bottom quartile, I cut it in two parts. Okay. So what you can see is that the targeted transfer package increased consumption of the very poor by more than 1% as compared to the case without stabilization. That's kind of large. And the targeted transfer package is very good at targeting the very poor almost by, by design. In fact, it targets the very poor better than the UI package, which, why? Because unemployment risk is a little bit more pervasive in the, in the distribution, so it's not necessarily concentrated on the very poor. It targets the lowest income even better than, uh, I mean, the worst really is a tax credit package in a sense that it's not so good at targeting the very poor, it's better at increasing consumption of the second group in my distribution. Why? Because the tax credit package targets the working poor, so they may not be at the very bottom of my, of my income distribution. So bottom line, the tax credit package may be the most efficient to st or effective to stabilize the economy, but that may come with some distributional concerns. It's not the best to target the very poor. Just something to keep in mind. The last thing I want to do is to compare the effect of this tax credit package to the effect of a standard public spending shock. So again, I'm going to model a temporary increase in public spending, which will cost the same as all the other packages, so that they are comparable. And I'm going to show you multipliers for, for output and for consumption. So in terms of output, what you can see is that the tax credit package is essentially as effective as the public spending. Maybe the public spending is even a little bit better to stabilize the economy in terms of output. But public spending actually crowds out private consumption. So in terms of stabilizing private demand, the, the tax credit package is really much, much better than the public spending package. Okay, so to conclude, we, I mean, what I try to show you is that so we should really, I mean, we should maybe think more about the importance of labor tax cuts to stabilize the economy. Why? Especially when it's targeted to low-income households. And why is that? Because it's, it can simulate both labor supply and consumption at once, and so it can have large effects to stabilize the economy. And in further research, we are starting to think about the positive effect of temporary cuts in consumption taxes, which is something I'll uh, leave for future research. Thank you. Thank you, Aksan. So the discussant is Benjamin Born from the Frankfurt School of Finance. Floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. I enjoyed this very much. Uh, it's, it's super timely, super interesting, uh, very rich. So let me just say this up front so that uh, the mood is not turning negative here, so I really like this paper. Um, as I said, it's, it's a feature-rich model, carefully calibrated, as you saw on the slides. It's, um, it might seem like an easy exercise to calibrate this model and run a few policies, but I mean, in the background, there's a huge, huge machinery. Um, and I think also the, the horse race that they're conducting here between different stabilization policies is very sensible and yields interesting insights. So let me first summarize uh, the paper on one slide, and then I add a few uh, comments and suggestions. So uh, what do Axel and uh, Gaston do here? So they take a quantitative Hank model, uh, I think of the type that they have used for other research before. They um, have a very rich fiscal sector here. Um, they now add to this an extensive margin labor supply decision and counter cyclical unemployment risk. So it's not a full blown search and matching framework, but I think for the question at hand here, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
And then they hit this economy with a preference shock that causes a demand-driven recession. So that's basically the starting point from which they judge then the stabilization policies. Um, and, and what they do then is they do a horse race. So basically they have three major stabilization policies. One is a, a targeted transfer to low income households. And here it's the employed low income, but also the unemployed. So it, it uh, reaches both of these types. Then the second policy is a, just a top up of the unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, so that reaches only the unemployed. That's standard in the US, for example, uh, in the CARES Act. And then the, the new one is um, what they call TC, a labor tax credit, or sometimes they call a labor tax cut. Uh, I will talk about this a little bit. So, and this is specifically only targeted at employed workers. So the nice thing here, this is like a carrot that you dangle in front of the unemployed. Here, come to work, then you get this transfer. Huh? Um, and what Excel showed us is that all three packages stabilize the demand-driven recession but to different degrees. And, and here what really comes out is that the labor tax credit is the most effective one. Um, it stabilizes output and the nice add-on is that it's also less inflationary than the other ones. And the, the key here is really this labor supply channel that's only present with, with this uh, labor tax cut. So this, this carrot induces people uh, to enter the labor force, um, and, and that pushes up output. Whereas the, the consumption channel is there for all three of these, of these things. So let me come to my, my first comment. Um, and so, so this TC package, the tax credit package, is, is essentially in the model, it's a ten, uh, transfer to the working poor. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a monetary transfer. Um, it depends positively on, on labor income in the sense you only get it if you, uh, so it depends on positive labor income. So you only get it when you work um, and therefore it incentivizes work. Um, so in the paper, uh, the authors interpret this as equivalent to a labor tax cut for low income households. Um, and I was wondering, so if you just think of an income tax cut uh, and you, you look at, for example, so I found this for Germany. I didn't found it for, for the US, but for the point, I think it's fine to look at this. So this shows the, um, the taxes and social security contributions as percent of gross household income. So basically, this is the household distribution, so the poorest households to the richest, and then how much they pay in different, uh, for example, personal corporate income taxes, but also social security contributions. What you see for the bottom 30%, so in Germany with a highly progressive in income tax schedule, the bottom 30% don't pay labor income uh, taxes. So purely cutting labor taxes doesn't, doesn't really work for these, the, the bottom households. Now, of course, um, what Axel and Gaston look at here is a tax credit. So it's a little bit different, but of course, this will also only benefit those low income, uh, so the, the bottom uh, of the distribution, if it's refundable in the sense, if you don't have a tax uh, liability, you still get a transfer. And I was wondering, so for, for a setup like this, where maybe you're promised a refund in the future, how salient is this transfer really for you? You don't see it in your bank account right away. It, it takes some time. Um, so, so I was just wondering how you think about this. So, it is not a criticism of the model. In the model, it's just a transfer. But if we think of a tax cut, um, that might depend on the, how progressive the, the system already is. And also, um, you cite in the paper uh, the, the evidence from Sidar uh, in the JPE. But what he, he calls low income is the bottom 90% of the distribution. So that, of course, also in, incorporates the, the middle of the distribution. So I was just wondering, how, and this also matters, of course, for the implementation, if you really want to uh, go for this. So the, the second comment, so maybe I missed it in the paper. Now you had a slide on distributional uh, aspects, but I think um, you can do a bit more because you have such a rich model, feed, um, the rich heterogeneities here, uh, but you focus very much on macroeconomic aggregates. And I understand that because it's uh, the focus is on aggregate stabilization. But still, I mean, you have all this, so why, why don't you show more? So, for example, also uh, unemployment, uh, 
maybe uh, responses uh, across the income distribution or wages, um, um, but also top 10 income wealth shares. Or I mean, you, you now showed some, some consumption slices. And also, maybe if this is not too much work, at least to look a little bit at welfare, maybe one-sided welfare, it would be interesting uh, to see for, I don't, I don't know, quintiles, quartiles or so, some, some effects of these different programs. Um, so it would just be interesting. Um, my third comment relates to the exercise uh, that um, Axel uh, looks at here. So this is a preference shock-induced demand-driven recession. Um, by the way, you have a very small shock uh, in, in the end. The unemployment rate is at like basis point response. I was just wondering in terms of uh, presentation, uh, maybe scale it up. <laughs> um, and, and she shows that this labor supply channel is really crucial for, for the effectiveness of um, this tax credit. Uh, but there might be crises where this channel is muted. So for example, of course, this is an extreme, the pandemic uh, here, I have initial claims. This is the extreme where you have the lockdown and, and everyone is sent, being sent home. Uh, my, my hunch would be there, this labor supply channel doesn't work. People might want to work more, but um, there, there's no de labor demand. And then the, the question might be, you want to really help the unemployed and, and not induce them to work more, but really just help, uh, help them with a the transfer. So it might be that you, you, you could look at different recessions, maybe uh, simulate some supply-driven recessions, or, or at least discuss this. Uh, and um, so my, my last uh, major comment is, is on the pra uh, practical implementation of this policy. So we know fiscal policy has a rich set of tools uh, for business cycle stabilization, but how do we implement them now efficiently? And Often, there, it's a very discretionary manner. So if you look at the pandemic and the, the CARES Act that increased and extended the UI benefits, so there, it was not an automatic stabilizer, but you have these FPOC and, and all these abbreviations, uh, massive extension um, of the unemployment uh, benefits. Um, but of course, these, are, these discretionary um, decisions are subject to political economy issues. And with more polarization, this might, might become even more uh, difficult to do this in a timely manner and of course also implementation lags. So Axel pushes a bit in the paper that why, why not have labor taxes respond systematically and uh, maybe through the payroll tax or something else. But even that might be politically controversial if you think of time varying progressiveness of the political system. You might have on the right people that don't like a more progressive system and on the left uh, people say well incentives to the poor, that's not the right thing. We should just help them and, and give them uh, transfers. Um, and then also, if you set up a rule like this, what's the observable that in real time you really know how to adjust uh, these, these taxes? Um, and then in the end, I mean, the, the paper here makes some progress on understanding which, which of these instruments uh, might give you more bang for the buck. But then still, um, going back to my point of the pandemic, in different crises, there might be different instruments that are really optimal. So how would you do that? So this is not so much about the paper, but more thinking more broadly in the spirit of the title of this conference. How, how would we do this in practice? And just last one minor comment. So you have also this G increase in, in the paper. So an increase in government spending that give, gets a, a very large multiplier which is per se not surprising in the Hank model, but then you write, it's going hand in hand with a large crowding out of private consumption. So I was just wondering, uh, so what's the mechanism that then gives you this large multiplier? You don't have any investment or anything in there. So, uh, but that's a minor issue. Maybe we can discuss this later. Okay, so let me sum up. Uh, I think I'm out of time. So it's a very clean exercise uh, with high policy relevance. Uh, my advice would be to expand the discussion at various points, to put a little bit more meat on the bones of the paper, uh, but I'm certainly looking forward to, to the next iteration of this. Thanks. So the second paper is going to be presented by Tobias Breuer, also from the Paris School of Economics, and it's about the distributional effects of oil price shocks. <laughs>
thank you for the audience of making time to comment to the organizers for putting our paper on the program although little did they know what this paper would be um, because we didn't know it either this is the first time we present this some results are barely a week old which makes me uh, ex makes me apologize to amanda our discussant um, but which makes your comments very valuable. So this is really very new and I'd be keen to hear what you have to say about it. It's with uh, John and Kurt and we were all at IES Stockholm at some point. This paper comes in a mainstream macro tradition that is well established, which sees business cycles as propagation of shocks. And more recently uh, within this body of work, we've looked at uh, at the also the distributional effects of kind of macroeconomic shocks and innovations to policies of course more recently we've seen what i think is generally interpreted as large supply shocks in the world economy and eventually a uh, strong monetary response to them so what we think um, is the question that that raises is how do supply shocks and monetary responses affect inequality and we look at one particular supply shock in this paper only. We look at oil shocks or what, uh, what can be interpreted as a, as, a, as a supply news shock to world oil production. And because these oil shocks, they feed through into inflation relatively quickly and that, uh, that um, causes a monetary policy response, we think it's interesting to, to, to think about what part of the responses to oil shocks that we observe in data are due to the oil price shock itself and which part is due to the monetary policy response we're trying to disentangle those uh, two things in the paper using purely empirical methods so we're going to look at the response of individual level variables i mean uh, employed the earnings um, of employed individuals and labor market transitions in german administrative data by uh, quantile of the permanent income distribution and we're going to look at the uh, response under the observed monetary policy and under a counterfactual non-monetary response scenario now of course we would expect um we would expect central banks to respond uh, to to oil price shocks so any non-response is a surprise to, to the to us economists and the private sector more generally and then there is an issue about how you think about those surprises. Uh, one way of thinking about it would be to say, oh, every period I expect the monetary policy to respond, but actually the central bank doesn't raise the interest rate. And that is very similar to a method developed by Simpson Zah in the late 90s, where you just add a sequence of monetary policy shocks throughout the response to some exogenous innovation that keeps the interest rate counterfactually at zero every period. A different kind of surprise would be that in the period where the oil price shock hits, the central bank stands up and says, we are actually not going to respond to this shock. And in, the, in other words, it's a credible change in policy stance. Um, and there is a recent paper by McKay and Wolf that allows us to, uh, you know, to, to, to identify this kind of counterfactual policy, which is less, sub, less subject to the Lucas critique, of course, than the first one. What we find is that over the last 20, uh, 45 years in Germany, oil price shocks have reduced activity, increased inflation, and have triggered a pronounced monetary policy response. However, on the individual level, these uh, oil price shocks have strongly reduced earnings and employment of the income poor, but had very little effect above median income. And at least when it comes to, to the deterioration of employment prospects, that is to a large extent, and I have reverted these three words several times substantially one might say or much um, due to the monetary policy reaction i'm not going to talk about the literature much but let me just point out that there is an interesting paper here by my discussant amanda and co-authors um, which is kind of like a nice theoretically a compliment uh, 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 to to our empirical um work i'm going to talk about the data first and then about the aggregate and distributional effects and then about counterfactual policies so we look uh, we use german administrative data in particular we use a two percent sample of uh, labor market biographies from the social security administration which means that we miss the people that are not part of this which are the self-employed and public employees we um exploit the fact that this data comes at daily frequency but the inverted commas there they are meaningful here because we have the start and end dates of all 
employment relationships, and but only uh, observe earnings averaged over those employment spells over or at an annual frequency, whatever is, uh, whatever is higher. Um, we focus on attached workers. That those are the employed or the unemployed that started their unemployment spell with public benefits, so that have contributed to the to the unemployment insurance system for some time, and that are, are not too young and not too old. We use a longer sample than in our previous work because we want to cover the 70s, where most of the oil shocks hit, and we there are some top coding going on, and we exclude the top coded uh, German uh, German um, uh, social security has a top income threshold, and we don't observe incomes above that. And we look mainly at employment spells to define these employment transitions and at the within spell average uh, labor earnings. In terms of aggregate shocks, we take those from the shelf of the literature. Uh, namely, we look at Diego Kensick's uh, innovations to oil supply, um, in which he identifies using the kind of like high frequency uh, method, uh, looking at short windows around OPEC announcements. And then we look at two kinds of monetary policy shocks for Germany. First, for the Bundesbank period, we use the shocks identified using a narrative method by James Cloyne and others. And then um, my co-author John has a really nice paper with uh, some other ex-students in Stockholm where they use a high frequency method to identify um, the, the kind of uh, monetary policy shocks for the ECB period. So let's first look at the aggregate effects of oil shocks, and we use a standard uh, local projection methods here where the coefficient beta h is the effect of an oil price shock uh, or oil supply shock, I use those two expressions ex interchangeably, uh, of an oil shock in period t on an outcome variable uh, in period t plus h relative to the reference period in t minus h. And uh, we look at responses for oil shocks that are scaled to imply an impact response of prices of 10 percentage points. And there are some controls in there. Excuse me, there are some uh, controls in there that, that are kind of standard. We augment them with some averages from our microdata. And this is what we get. This picture is not optimized for viewing here, but I didn't know how to do this. And John thought deserved a policy, but I'll do a little bit of a, of a weatherman here. So um, first look at this, um, uh, at this price response here, 10% initially then rises a little bit and kind of moves, re, re, moves down by 50% over the first year and a half, comes with a, uh, comes with a uh, initial small rise, but then a protected fall in oil production. This can be interpreted like as, a, as an oil supply shock. What does it do to German aggregate activity? Look at unemployment here. It rises persistently up to one per, uh, up to ten basis points after uh, at a year and a half, and then kind of stays there. Our micro employment series is kind of like an imperfect mirror image of that. Um, the industrial production also falls, but less persistently so. And the earnings, uh, average earnings in our microdata fall uh, uh, fall also. So this is a contractionary oil. Uh, increase in the oil price. Uh, what does inflation do? Rises very quickly and then stays elevated about 20 to 10 to 20 basis points. Monetary policy responds relatively quickly, but after about a year, the policy response reverses sign and then goes back to to Z. So um, those are the aggregate responses that are kind of uh, not so different to what Diego finds in his work. How, how about the distributional effects? Um, here you can think about many things. What are different, uh, different heterogeneous uh, responses across sectors, across occupations, across regions in Germany, for example. We look at uh, heterogeneous responses within deciles of the permanent income distribution, which we take to mean five-year moving averages of the uh, uh, earnings in our microdata. And we use a panel local projection method, so where you can, um, where the delta H is the response coefficient at horizon h in the first d cell, and then these beta coefficients, they are the differences in d cells 2 to 10 relative to those to this reference first d cell. And um, we look at uh, indicators for employment transitions from uh, for the employed towards employment. So an indicator that takes value 1 if an employed person moves uh, is employed also uh, H period uh, periods from now, and we do the same for the currently unemployed, so U to E and E to E transitions, as we call them, and then we look at pretext earnings growth uh, growth of the employed. So here on the top left, you see the response uh, in the first decile of the permanent income distribution of E to E transitions to a 
10 percentage point rate, rate, um, increase in the oil price. Um, it was a very quick fall of about 20 basis points, and then the response kind of stays there, standard deviations uh, increase. On the right hand side, you see these beta coefficients, the differences uh, of other decides with respect to this reference group. The first thing to note is that apart from the period zero, all the dots are positive, all the dots are a beta coefficient, and you see that at different horizons along the bottom, with it, across decile groups, you see this increasing shape. So decile, the second decile has a slightly a slightly smaller negative response, but it's particularly from the median onwards that that there that the uh, it's, it's all the responses above the medium that are in particular uh, uh, smaller. So we see this pattern that perhaps is common from other shocks, also for oil shocks, that it's the bottom of the distribution whose employment prospects are most uh, affected. How about and this is for the employed? Um, how about the probability of the unemployed? to be employed age periods from now, well, that those also deteriorate in response to this contractionary oil shock um, by substantially more. This is one percentage point, but it takes substantially longer also to materialize. So this, uh, after about 20 months, the, the probability of being employed for the unemployed in the first decile contracts by about one percentage point. Here, the differences with respect to other deciles, are a little bit more mixed. So you see that the green and the, the red, sometimes they are negative, they're not so large, and they're close together, which means that there's less of a, uh, there's less of a consistent response initially, at least, uh, at the bottom of the distribution. But the blue and the, the blue and the dark red, they are always larger, which tells me that the, um, there is a stronger response in employment prospects at the, uh, in the first half of the distribution, but this is much muted above the media. Finally, let's look at earnings growth of the employed. Here you see an even more persistent decline by about 40 basis points in the first year, 75 basis points in the second year. And again, all the dots are positive, which means that the, 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 the earnings response is strongest in the first decile. And um, initially, there's not so much heterogeneity across the distribution, but then the gap really opens up and the response above the median um, is is much more muted than in the bottom half of the distribution. So what can we take away from this that um, oil shocks have the kind of aggregate effects that we would in Germany that we would uh, that we would expect, but their employment and earnings uh, effects are concentrated largely among the income poor. Now, but it begs the question, given the what we call a pronounced monetary response to these shocks, how much of these effects that we observe along the distribution and on aggregate, how much is due to the monetary response and how much is due to the oil price shocks or how much of that would, uh, uh, would materialize even in the absence of a monetary response. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna try to isolate exactly that. We're gonna try, exactly try to identify the question, how would German how would the German economy have responded without a monetary reaction, which we conceive of as a, 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 an interest rate, a normal interest rate that is unchanged? And we're going to again look at these two different kinds of methods. First of all, Sims and Zah, um, they think of a counterfactual interest rate response at horizon H equal to zero by adding to the observed response of interest rates to the oil price shock, a sequence of shocks in every period between zero and the response horizon of interest that, when taken together, implement this, this non-response. So the current, the T, plus, the T plus H interest rate shock offsets the effects on the interest rate of the oil price shock itself and any previous monetary shocks that has persistent effects on interest rates even until uh, period T plus H. Now, importantly, because you can every period choose the size of the shock, what kind of shock you have doesn't really matter. Any monetary policy impulse that you've estimated um, and the, for, for which you have the effects on the interest rate itself and on your variables of interest will do. And here we use what I call the full sample estimate and you will see what that is later. McKay and Wolf, they, uh, they rightly point out that this method is not uh, is subject to the Lucas critique because there are systematic surprises uh, of the private uh, uh, of economic agents. Um, but they show in their paper that one can conceive of a monetary non-response surprise also as just happening in the period when the shock hits. 
In particular, they, uh, they uh, argue that you could just implement all shocks in the period, uh, all monetary policy shocks in the period where the oil price shock hits, such that their sum or their weighted sum, um, when added to the effects of, uh, on the interest rate of the oil shock, sum to zero. Now, what that requires some assumptions, for example, that the monetary policy effects of different shocks are identical apart from the implied inter instrument path. So it's only the, the, uh, the, the heterogeneous effects of different shocks to monetary policy affect the economy only in different ways because the, uh, the, their implied interest rate paths differ. And the, the private sector or the economy more generally has full information about each of these shocks and their implied interest rate paths. You may think that those are strong assumptions, but subject uh, and subject to those and the maintained assumptions of linearity, you can just add shocks in the in period T that exactly offset the uh, uh, interest rate response to the oil shock, such that the counterfactual interest rate is equal to zero. What you do need is you need several sufficiently different monetary impulses because you're not likely to find one that exactly offsets the interest rate response to the oil shock itself. In an application, what McCain Wolf do is they say, well, you could just you, instead of setting the, the 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 instead of looking for a zero response of monetary policy, you can just try to minimize the monetary policy response by choosing the weights of a weighted sum of, for example, two different monetary policy shocks and their effects. And they look at the Roma and Roma shocks and those uh, identified by by um, Gertland Karadi. Here we're going to do we're going to do exactly this, but we're going to use the shocks um, identified by James Cloyne and others, and those uh, uh, um, by by John and his co-authors. Now this is they have different identification schemes, just as in McKay and Wolf's uh, application. However, they're also for different sample periods. So here the the maintained assumption that the responses are kind of constant over time has more bite because we identify. Um, we, 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 we use shocks that pertain to different periods, in fact, to different central banks. So you may think, we, you may think oh, this is heroic, but uh, those are the shocks that, 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 that we have. Um, okay, how do we identify the aggregate effects of monetary shocks that we need in order to do this? We just look at standard local uh, projection IV so, we, IV, so we instrument the monetary policy interest rate or the equivalent to the, to the Bundesbank's discount rate with the monetary policy shocks, and we estimate two separate first stage regressions for that. And we, in other words, we allow the, the, the effects of the controls and the loading of the interest rate on the shock to differ across these, these two shocks and therefore the two time periods. And uh, that gives us some fitted values that I will try to click on. Could you click on the TS button in the middle there, please? Thank you. So this is what these shocks look like. So this is the Bundesbank and this is the ECB. Maybe the ECB uh, uh, finds this comforting that it's, you know, there's, there's money, less shocks or much larger shocks, I don't know. But what it means, of course, is also that whenever we do the full sample estimation, it's totally dominated by the first period because the variation in the right-hand side variable, it, it, you know, has, has more periods and much larger, much larger variance. So uh, um, um, this is what this looks like. So the standard deviation of the first period is about seven times as large as the second period. Could you click on the first black button at the bottom, please? Thank you. And um, could you click, sorry, could you, I'm gonna, that's, that was the second button, but that's okay. Um, I see, that's okay. Control is over here. Uh, could you go back to the uh, to the slide that we started from? I thought I had control over going back and forth, but um, yeah, if you just keep yeah, I'll, okay. Um, if you keep going until the next slide that looks like that one, yeah, keep going, please. Um, so now you're going to see the aggregate monetary policy responses, and it's really a shame that yes keep going one more yes perfect oh you actually did exactly the right thing did you see that did you see that did the child the slide changed but nothing moved yeah that's that's because uh, thank you that's because it, it's essentially the same whether you estimate for the booba or for the for the full sample it's the same it's essentially the same because the variance is just so much larger um but you see 
you know, kind of responses that make sense, the unemployment rate, is, and this is a contraction sh shock of two standard deviations, um, the policy rate rises, then, you know, crosses the zero line after about a year and a half, and then, then it goes back a little bit. This uh, has initially little effect on the unemployment rate, then raises the unemployment by about 10, 10 basis points, conveniently as much as the oil price shock, has again, kind of like an imperfect mirror image on the microdata, employment effect lowers industrial production, earnings don't move much, and, uh, uh, and inflation falls after a little bit of a price puzzle. Could you go forward one more? Actually, I can do this myself now, thank you. So now I want you, I go back to the focus, I want you to focus on the unemployment rate. So now I go to the ECB, and it's not perfect because the scale changes a little bit, but I want you to notice that this response is basically unchanged. So this is a totally different sample period. It's a shock that has a standard deviation is one seventh of the, the one before, uh, and uh, it's a different central bank. And the unemployment response to that two standard deviation shock is essentially the same. We were we were quite surprised by this. Never mind. It's the same is true for the other activity variables. They kind of respond similarly, less perfectly identical, but they respond very similarly. What is very different is the earnings response. Uh, contraction monetary policy shock during the ECB uh, period raises earnings, perhaps there's a selection effect that, you know, the, the, the poor individuals, they become unemployed. Uh, inflation falls in somewhat different way, but importantly, the policy response is quite different. So the policy rises by less because the standard deviations are smaller, but then has this kind of cyclical shape, which we didn't see before. And that we can exploit um, in the McKay and Wolf path, because we need shocks that have different interest rate effects. So here you see the policy rate in blue is the one that we estimated, the policy response to the, to the oil shock, and then the green line is Sims and Zah, that's just zero by, by construction, and the red line is McKay and Wolf when I add a weighted average of these two shocks, and, um, and, uh, and that is just a dampened version, a substantially dampened version of the original response. I was going to show you the Sims and Zah, Zah shocks, but I'm not going to touch it. Um, they essentially add, it's very intuitive, a number of contractionary shocks in the beginning, but then because the interest rate response under the oil shocks uh, 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 turns negative and the original monetary policy impulse has a very persistent effect on the interest rate, then the shocks actually turn positive. So that such as over the first year and a half under Sims and Zah, you get kind of contractionary and, and, and expansionary monetary policy shocks that, are largely off, that largely offset each other. And that is important when you, for example, look at the unemployment rate here, where um, the increase is substantially dampened with McKay and Wolf because you essentially add kind of like half a uh, one standard deviation uh, uh, expansionary monetary policy shock that you know responds in, uh, whose impulse responses look very similar to the oil shock. They respond a little bit less initially, so there's little of a difference. But then a gap opens up that kind of reduces the the unemployment response to the oil shock by about fifty percent. That is less so with Sims and Zah because here you have smaller shocks that are expansionary at the beginning, it takes more time to make a difference, and then you start getting contractionary shocks to close this gap here, and then this, this, the difference between Sims and Zah's non-response and the actual response to the oil shock um, disappears over the horizon. So this is the intuition for the different differences in the red and the blue line. What you see is a substantially more inflationary response here than we've actually seen to the, uh, to, 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 to the oil shock. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, uh, skip the rest because I'm going to go to the distributional effects. In order to do the distributional counterfactuals, we do something a little bit more similar than the local projection IV. We just estimate decile by decile the uh, responses to the oil shock and the response to the monetary policy. In terms of the uh, distributional effects of monetary policy, we get something that we found in our previous paper, substantially stronger reaction at the bottom when you look at a, a contractionary monetary policy shock here. Again, the, the graphs, they, sh they look almost identical. The response for the ECB sample is slightly larger. Um, these are the E to E transitions, I should say. This is along the distribution of income. So for every decile at horizon H uh, uh, equal to 18. So we look at the 18 month response in res uh, to a monetary policy shock along the income distribution, substantially stronger incidence at the bottom. Um, for the U to E transitions, this is less true. There is an increasing shift. There's essentially little difference, and it's also not particularly significant for the uh, bottom two tercials, and then an increase in the top tercile, and that is 
the same largely for all the subsamples that we look at. Finally, the third individual variable that we look at is the um, is the earnings of the employed, and uh, there you can see essentially no response during the during the first part uh, of our sample or the full sample, which are again very very similar. But there is a little bit of an increase during the ECB sample, so that might be a little bit surprising. But again, it's indicative of perhaps a selection effect where it's the uh, the the, the, the poorer income, the lower earnings uh, individuals within deciles that are more likely to become unemployed. Um, and therefore, the earnings of the employed actually rise after a contraction of monetary policy shock. So now we want to, uh, finally, I'm going to conclude with the counterfactual, distributional counterfactual. So here, the, the blue line is the original response of our three variables of interest namely um, the E to E transitions, the U to E transitions, and the earnings of the employed at horizon H equal to 18 months um, under the observed monetary policy. And as I said before, you see this kind of increasing shape, substantially stronger response of uh, below the median, some, are, some heterogeneity, and particularly the earnings response is significant even up to the very uh, up to the very top and increases strongly at the very bottom and is then kind of flat. Um, how, what, what, does, what is the contribution of monetary policy to these, to, to these distributional effects? Well, if we believe the McKay and Wolf identification uh, scheme, then in terms of the E to E transitions, it's essentially all that monetary policy, uh, it's essentially only the monetary policy reaction, only the monetary contraction in response to the oil shocks that causes the decline in employment prospects uh, 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 at this horizon. So if we add uh, these weighted average of expansionary monetary policy shocks to the original uh, response of employment pro pro prospects, then they're essentially zero. That is true for the U to E transitions, apart from this very lower part. So in the first decile, it is uh, the, monetary, the monetary policy counterfactual makes less of a difference here. And um, the effect flips for the McKay and Wolf method here for the earnings growth. And that was because the, 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 during the ECB sample, which the McKay and Wolf method gives quite a lot of weight to, the earnings were actually increased by um, earnings growth was increased by a contraction in monetary policy shock. So then when you add an expansion, when you add an expansionary monetary policy shock to this oil shock, and earnings actually decline a little bit. How about Sims and Za? Well, it turns out that Sims and Za makes substantially less of a difference. So here, Sims and Za reduces the response by a, four, a quarter, while with, with McCain Wolf, we get a reduction of three quarters. And that's because at horizon 18 months, the initial expansionary shocks and the eventual contractionary shocks that this method requires, they have kind of almost cancelled each other out. That's our interpretation of this very small response on the distributional effects at, at this horizon. So I presume I'm out of time. Um, let me just quickly summarize. So we've, we've shown that oil shocks raise inflation and uh, lower output and employment as we would have expected. But the employment and earnings decline uh, uh, are essentially concentrated uh, among the income poor and the lower half of the permanent income distribution. And at least when you look at the employment responses, then much of that seems to be due to the monetary uh, policy reaction to the oil price shock and would be absent in the absence of that. What do we think uh, is are useful areas of future research? Um, well, first of all, one could look at other dimensions of heterogeneity, sectors, occupations, regions. We were initially very excited about sectors, but the sectoral split of the data is not perfect. So um, we, 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 so far we didn't find, find much. Um, one could look also at other supply shocks, of course, that would be interesting. And then maybe instead of comparing the Bundesbank uh, monetary policy to the ECB monetary policy, one could also look at different um, series of monetary policy shocks for the same, uh, uh, namely the ECB period, and try to grind those through the machinery to see what kind of uh, difference that makes to the result. Thank you, Tobias. So
So the discussion for this paper is Amalia Repele from Bocconi University. The floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Um, yeah, first, uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a really great pleasure for me to discuss uh, the paper that Tobias just um, discussed, uh, presented. So let me start uh, in the subject. So what the paper is after is to understand the effect of supply shocks on the economy and how uh, uh, they depend on the monetary policy response. So the question is not new, um, but uh, what is new is that they use this micro administrative um, matched employer employee data in Germany. And um, I think the two main contributions of the paper is to disentangle the role of pure oil shocks from uh, their monetary policy response and also to be able, uh, thanks to the micro data, to characterize uh, distributional effects of these aggregate shocks. Um, let me very quickly summarize uh, the findings. Uh, so first, um, uh, oil shocks increase inflation and decrease output. So this is kind of a confirmation um, of uh, their analysis with uh, other um, literature. Um, and then they show that, at least in Germany, the output drop is not uh, fully driven by the monetary policy response. And on the distributional uh, aspects, low-wage workers are uh, disproportionately uh, negatively affected um, because if they work, uh, they experience a lower earning growth in the medium run. And if they're unemployed, uh, they uh, have a ha harder time finding uh, a job relative to higher deciles. Um, so, on the methodology, they use a local projection model with uh, instrumental variables. Here I write the equation without the instruments, just for uh, simplicity. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, what is new is that they um, include uh, variables that come from this uh, micro data. So, these are employment and earnings. And then they also have other uh, more standard macro uh, series like the CPI or uh, industrial production. Um, and then on the right hand side, just beside our um, coefficient of interest, there is uh, an aggregate shock. Uh, the oil shock comes from Diego Kensick's work and the uh, monetary policy shock they um, built from uh, existing work. Um, then they look at policy counterfactuals and I will come back to this um, in two slides and uh, heterogeneous effects by running this regression um, uh, on different income decides. Um, okay, so I thought it would be interesting to give some uh, theoretical context about uh, monetary policy and supply shock. So I think whether monetary policy should uh, respond to supply shock has been uh, becoming a very salient question uh, since the Euro area faced a surge in energy prices in um, 2021. And uh, so in the most standard model, the answer should be no monetary policy um, uh, by uh, responding to that shock would actually increase inflation volatility. But uh, in more complex models, there are different reasons for monetary policy uh, to, to have an incentive to step in. Uh, first, it could uh, be that there are second round effects um, so that you know, if workers uh, ask for uh, nominal um, uh, wage increases, to protect their real wage, uh, this would uh, um, become infl uh, inflationary. Um, or if you think of an open economy framework where um, the domestic economy is importing uh, energy, just like uh, it's the case in the euro area, then um, you know if consumers uh, are able to substitute away the foreign uh, energy intensive goods that became more expensive, this would uh, increase demand for the domestic uh, less energy producing goods. Um, and on the other side, this would be a kind of a negative terms of trade shock. So also foreign consumers might uh, increase their demand for domestic goods. And uh, finally, if uh, you think of a world where um, there are some constrained, uh, liquidity constrained individuals, um, and if they face this real income shock, negative income shock that they cannot insure against, this would uh, directly lead to a decrease in aggregate demand in the domestic economy. So actually the quantitative and qualitative answer to this question is not clear. And of course the labor market response will also depend on which force dominates. So um, 
He actually talked about uh, this recent paper that we have with uh, two ex-colleagues from the ECB, and there we introduce uh, all of these uh, all of these things in a in a Hank model and study different policy rules uh, as a um, response to to an imported energy price shock. Um, so back to the paper, how they. Um, deal with this question is uh, through this new methodology uh, by McKay and Wolf. And um, this paper explains how you can construct any policy counterfactual uh, that is robust to Lucas critique. So that's quite nice. It's kind of the, the equivalent to a, a, an IRF in a DSGE model. Um, um, and this is what they do uh, in this. Uh, so I just picked uh, uh, one figure. Um, so the blue line is the original, like uh, the policy rate uh, response of the estimate. And then the red line is this counterfactual uh, policy um, that they target to be as close to zero as possible. So the drawback of this approach is that um, uh, the result is valid given the availability of enough uh, shock series. And you see that here actually the, the policy rate is not uh, that close to zero. So uh, in the first period, the tightening is, is uh, of a magnitude almost higher than, than, the, than the actual tightening uh, that, uh, that they estimate. Um, so the other uh, approach that they use is this Sims and Sun, which, uh, as Tobias explained, relies on the fact that the economy is uh, uh, surprised at every period with uh, shocks. And that you know, allows to achieve uh, a flat policy rate. Um, so my first comment is that it would be really interesting to uh, bridge the empirical evidence that they have with existing uh, theoretical evidence. And uh, by this, I think uh, it could be interesting to pick different monetary policy counterfactuals. So not only the zero response, but for example, a Taylor rule or um, what we find in our paper is that the strength of the monetary policy response uh, really uh, affects the transmission mechanisms and so also you know the uh, effect on inequalities that uh, they might find um, and to help in that exercise uh, so to help in the limitation maybe you could use other um, monetary policy shocks um, the second thing is uh, instead of the sims and ta um, method, you could uh, maybe leverage almost 10 years of zero lower bound where interest rates were kind of fixed and uh, arguably, you know, uh, monetary policy was not answering to um, uh, uh, supply shock with uh, quantitative easings. Um, and this you could test in the sample. So talking about the sample, the unified uh, time sample, so you show that uh, basically the monetary policy shocks uh, uh, transmits equally in the two uh, time samples, but um, I'm I'm wondering whether it's the case also for the oil price shock. So the policy framework and the labor market changed a lot uh, in Germany since the 70s. Um, uh, the Bundesbank had also exchange rate um, secondary objectives, which may be really important for uh, oil price uh, shocks. And the labor market uh, was heavily um, liberalized, so this could also improve the monetary policy trade-off as a as a response to to supply shocks. Um, and then finally, about heterogeneity. So you talked a little bit about it uh, at the end. Um, I think uh, it would be really interesting to learn more because there's this. Uh, micro evidence that is re really rich and so you know um, um, low income uh, permanent income uh, households are more affected but can we learn more from uh, education groups um, social uh, demographic industry or occupations and I think this could uh, help understand a bit what's the uh, transmission mechanism uh, and here I, I, I in put two uh, other references. Uh, the first one is another um, project that we have with an ex-colleague uh, that uh, uh, actually we use the same data set in Germany and we look at the mm, effect of monetary policy shocks and we find, for example, uh, an important role of the firms in this transmission mechanism. Another example is Kolianese, Olson and Patterson, which uh, find that in Sweden, uh, nominal uh, wage rigidities are important in how monetary policy uh, translates into uh, labor market. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>